And uh, I respect my colleagues who've worked hard to try to bring it forward. I thank the chair and we yield the floor. Debate from the Senate floor yesterday on raising the nation's debt ceiling. Of course, it passed in the House yesterday by a vote of 269 to 161. The final debate moves here to the Senate this morning with an expected vote on final passage set for noon Eastern today. Leaders agree that 60 votes will be needed to pass it on to uh, President Obama for his signature. Live coverage of that debate and vote right now here on C-SPAN 2. The chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Give ear to our prayers, eternal God, and guide us like a shepherd leads a flock. Turn us toward you as you cause your face to shine so that we shall be saved. Feed our lawmakers with the bread of wisdom so that they will accomplish your purposes. Delivering them from the tyranny of the trivial, may they trust you to guide their steps. As they remember the high price and preciousness of freedom, inspire them with the relentless and sacrificial vigilance required to preserve it. We pray in your great name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., August 2, 2011, to the Senate, under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Jean Shaheen, a senator from the state of New Hampshire, to perform the duties of the chair. Signed, Daniel K. Inouye, President Pro Tempore. Madam President. The Majority Leader. Following any leader remarks, I'll make a motion to concur in the House message to Company S-365, the legislative vehicle, the debt limit compromise. The time until noon will be equally divided and controlled for debate on the legislation. At noon, the Senate will conduct a roll call, a roll call vote on the most concurrent in the House message with a 60 vote threshold. Madam President, I ask consent, unanimous consent, that an intern in Senator Bingham's office trade to Brian be granted floor privileges during today's business. Without objection. Note the absence of quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. President. The Majority Leader. I ask the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. I now ask the Chair to lay before the Senate the House message to Company S-365. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. And the Chair lays before the Senate a message from the House. Resolved that the bill from the Senate, S-365, entitled an act to make a technical amendment to the Education Sciences Reform Act of 2002, do pass with an amendment. Madam President, prior to the previous order, I now move to concur in the House amendment to S-365. The motion is pending. Uh, Senator McConnell and I have completed our statements. So as I understand it, we move to the matter before the Senate. Is that right? The Senator is correct. Go ahead. Madam President. The Senator from Tennessee. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent that speakers on the Republican side be allocated up to 10 minutes each. Without objection. Madam President, finally, 
Washington is taking some responsibility for spending money that we don't have. At a time when the federal government is borrowing 40 cents of every dollar it spends, this is a welcome change in behavior, and I gladly support it. Make no mistake, this is a change in behavior. From spend, 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 to cut, cut, cut. Let me give you one example. On Christmas Eve in 2010, Congress raised the debt ceiling and attached to it a trillion dollars in new spending over 10 years in the new health care law. This time, for every dollar we're raising the debt ceiling, we're reducing spending by a dollar, not adding to it. This reduction in spending over 10 years is about $2.4 trillion. And here's another example. According to Senator Portman, who used to be the nation's budget director, the Congressional Budget Office would say that if Congress did this kind of dollar-for-dollar -dollar reduction for spending every time a president asks us to raise the debt ceiling, we'd balance the budget in 10 years. And here's another one. The Wall Street Journal reported yesterday that because of these spending cuts, the discretionary part of the budget, which is about 39 percent of the entire federal budget, will grow over the next 10 years at a little less than the rate of inflation. If we could control the rest of the budget so that it would grow at anything close to the rate of inflation, we would balance the budget in no time. And balancing the budget is exactly what our goal ought to be. I did it every year as governor of Tennessee. Families in America do it every day. It's time to balance the government's books and live within our means. These spending reductions are an important step, but they're just one step, and no one should underestimate how difficult the next steps will be. These spending cuts do almost nothing to restructure Medicare and Social Security so that seniors can count on them and taxpayers can afford them. The President's budget projections still double and triple the federal debt. Under the President's budgets, according to the Congressional Budget Office, in 10 years, we'll be spending more on interest on the debt than we spend on national defense. And in January 2013, the very first thing the next president will have to do is to ask the Congress to increase the debt ceiling. This problem wasn't created overnight, and it won't be solved overnight. But if I were sitting at Union Station trying to catch a train to New York, and someone offered me a ticket to Philadelphia or Baltimore, I'd take it, and then I'd find a way to get to New York from there. So today's vote is an opportunity to take an important step in the right direction towards stopping Washington from spending money it doesn't have. We should take it and then get ready to find ways to take the next step and the next step and the next. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor. The Senator from Illinois. Madam President, this is an historic vote, and it's one that has uh, involved a lot of emotion and a lot of soul searching and a lot of hard work. Our leaders are on the floor, Democratic and Republican leaders of the Senate, Senators Reid and McConnell. I want to salute both of them for working so hard to bring us to this moment where we have an opportunity to vote. The House has passed this legislation so-called Budget Control Act. The Senate will take it up shortly. It is my belief that it will also pass in the United States Senate. But my vote for this legislation does not come without some pain. You're told in life to follow your conscience. Well, Madam President, on this matter, my conscience is conflicted. If this bill should fail, we will default on our nation's debt. That will be the first time that has ever happened. And if we should default at midnight tonight on our nation's debt, terrible things will ensue. We will find America's credit rating in the world diminished, the interest rates which we pay as a nation increased, the cost of money for businesses and families across the United States will increase at exactly the wrong time in the midst of recession. If we fail to pass this legislation, tomorrow the Secretary of the Treasury would sit down with the President of the United States and decide in the month of August which Americans who were expecting a check will actually receive one. Will we pay Social Security recipients? 
Will we pay the members of our military? Will we pay the Central Intelligence Agency? It is an impossible choice that the President would face if we fail. But there's another side to the story. If this bill passes, we will reduce spending on critical programs. We have to be honest about it. Fewer children from poor families will be enrolled in early childhood education. Working families and their children will face even more debt to pay for college education. Medical research will likely be cut, and the list goes on. So from where I stand, it is not the clearest moral choice. I spoke to our chaplain before we started this session about a line in Shakespeare that I have always struggled to understand. It is from Hamlet, and it's the line in his famous soliloquy when he said, conscience makes cowards of us all. This morning, I still cannot clearly articulate what it means, but I feel it, struggling with this conscience question of defaulting on our debt with all of the consequences on innocent people across America and passing this bill with all of the consequences on innocent people in America. Madam President, I've spent the last year and a half focused on this debt situation like I've never been focused before. I understand it a little better today than I did when I started. And I've come to the conclusion that if we are going to be honest about our debt and honest about reducing it, we have to be honest on how it will happen. Sure, we must cut spending. That's where we have to start. But we also have to understand that it goes beyond that. We have to be prepared to raise revenue. In the Bowles Simpson Commission and in the Gang of Six, I thought we came up with an honest answer to that question. It was a balanced approach that put everything on the table. Well, this bill makes a serious and significant down payment in spending cuts. Now a joint committee is created to take the next step. I will say this, if the next step is to be fair, if the next step is to be serious, it has to go beyond spending cuts. It has to look at serious questions about how we can save money in entitlement programs without compromising our commitment and how we can ask those who have profited so well in America, who live so comfortably, to join us in this effort by paying more in taxes. That is the stark reality. If we continue to move toward more and more spending cuts, we will literally disadvantage the poor and working families of America to the advantage of those who are well off. That isn't fair and it isn't right. Many, of us, many people who criticize this say, you know, you don't even read these bills that you vote on. So yesterday I sat down to read this bill. It's not that long. And I will have to tell you that the front end of the bill is almost unintelligible. You need someone from the Budget Committee sitting next to you to explain each paragraph. But I, I basically understand that portion of it. I also understand the portion that Senator McConnell proposed of how we'll sequence requests for increase in the national debt. I, I certainly understand and am puzzled in some ways by the Joint Committee's um, basic charge to find in 10 weeks anywhere from $1.2 to $1.5 trillion in savings over the next 10 years. In 10 weeks, these 12 members of the House and Senate are to come together and reach an agreement. It's a daunting task. But there's one provision in here that I really want to call the attention of the Senate to. And it's one that troubles me greatly. It is a provision that calls for, requires, that the United States Senate and House of Representatives before December 31st of this year vote on a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. Madam President, I searched this bill long and hard to find the language of that constitutional amendment because I thought, if we're going to have to face the prospect of amending the Constitution, I want to know what the language is. This is a an awesome responsibility. Madam President, you can read this bill from top to bottom. There is not one word of substance about that amendment. All it says is the House and Senate shall consider a bill which is a, quote, joint resolution to amend the Constitution of the United States to balance the budget. End of quote, end of substance, end of reference in this bill. It gets better. Not only do they require us to take up a balanced budget amendment, 
and failed to include the language of that amendment, listen closely, this bill says there shall be no amendments to the proposed resolution in committee in the House or on the floor of the House, in the committees of the Senate, nor on the floor of the Senate. Take it or leave it. As I say these words, I can imagine Robert C. Byrd descending from heaven, standing at that desk and waving this Constitution and reminding members of the United States Senate that one of the few times in our lives when we've taken a solemn oath, members of the Senate swore to uphold and defend this document, this writing. He would find it nothing short of outrageous that we are mandating a vote on a constitutional amendment that is not even written that we are prohibiting the House and the Senate from considering, even considering, the change of one word in that proposed constitutional amendment. Madam President, I think the language of this bill entirely discredits this effort toward a constitutional amendment. We cannot take it seriously if we take our oath seriously to uphold and defend this document. Madam President, at the end of the day, I will vote for this measure, and obviously with a heavy heart, there are parts of it that I will struggle to explain and defend, but I can't let this American economy descend into chaos if we fail to extend the debt ceiling. The job ahead will be hard, but let us hope that we will, in reducing this deficit further, do it in a balanced and fair way with everything on the table. At the end of the day, members of Congress and people in higher income categories should feel that they too are called to sacrifice. If we ask that of the poorest in America and of working families, we can ask no less of members of Congress and those who are well off in this great nation. Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. The other senator from Illinois. Thank you, Madam President. Although this bill reflects a balanced approach, Americans also expect a balanced budget. We need to apply the common sense of the heartland to spend within our means as each family does with its monthly budget. The battle over this legislation was hard fought. We have finally started to change a 40-year culture of overspending and overborrowing in just 40 days. We hear the American people and we respect their judgment. They tell us that they are not undertaxed. They tell us that Washington overspends. We have a government that claims to support a strong economy, but urges tax increases that will weaken it. We hear speeches from some who want to expand employment, but then attack employers. They argue for more access to credit but then assail the banks that would provide it. They call for more American energy, but decry the very explorers who would find it. We need more straight talk and accountability. Small businesses provide the most jobs, and we should reward them. Inventors create new economies, and we should encourage them. Many government programs fail in their objectives, sometimes for decades and we should cancel them. We face mounting government debts. The way to pay these debts is to generate more jobs, creating more taxpayers who will provide additional revenue, not new federal job-killing taxes. Given the views of our president and the economically liberal members of this Senate, the legislation before us is the best deal that we can get. This legislation caps regular appropriations of the Congress. It eliminates procedural impediments so that we will vote on how to cut automatic spending programs. We even installed automatic spending programs regardless of congressional gridlock as a backstop to ensure fiscal responsibility. This bill prevents a crisis from breaking out this week. It also begins to control automatic spending programs, many of whom have run without much accountability since the 1960s. All of this is a down payment on further ways to bring common sense, 
accountability, and control to the spending of our government. These basic values are the foundation of America's 200-year experiment in self-government. If we fail, we deliver a free people into the hands of a financial bondage. If we succeed, we honor the promise of limited government that offers greater and greater liberties to each generation of Americans so that they can reach their own potential. I will vote for this legislation because it begins to make the hard choices to keep us free. But it is only a first step and a crucial one to increase the transparency, the performance, and results we should demand from America's government. This bill sets an important, an important precedent to reform automatic spending. If we use that precedent again, then I can imagine an America that once again becomes the best place on earth for inventors and families to start and expand businesses that will provide for their children and, in a few cases, will span the globe with American exports to each market of the planet. And, Madam President, with that, I yield back. The Senator from New Mexico. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Over the, the past two years, our country has been struggling to recover from one of the worst economic recessions in our history. Democrats have worked to pass legislation that would create jobs. It's been our top priority. But at every turn, we've faced resistance from ideologues who care more about winning political points and protecting the wealthy than doing what is right for hardworking American families. That is exactly what happened during this debt ceiling debate. Instead of passing a clean extension and getting to work on our economy, we've been, we've been forced to vote on a last-minute deal to prevent the economic catastrophe that would result in default. I've spent the last few weeks and months highlighting the real-life consequences of default for New Mexico families at a time when families are already dealing with extremely tight budgets. A default would mean increased cost for just about everything, from food to gas to housing to sending the kids to college. It would also jeopardize critical federal benefits that veterans, seniors, and others depend on to pay the bills and stay healthy. It would mean more than 360,000 New Mexicans in danger of losing their Social Security benefits. It would mean another, another 300,000 who would rely on Medicare, seeing their health care disrupted. It would mean 174,000 New Mexico veterans may not receive their benefits, and more than 1,400 active duty military personnel may not receive paychecks for their services. But it wouldn't stop there. Even if you don't depend on a check from the federal government every month for health care or retirement or other benefits, you would still feel the financial pain of default. That's because mortgage payments would increase by more than $1,000 for the average family. And credit card interest would go up by $250. Why is it, you ask? Because the interest you pay on just about every loan you have, whether it's a house or a car or college tuition, it's based on the interest rates the Treasury pays. And if, and if that interest rate rises, as it would in a default, so does the interest rate on just about everything else. New Mexicans can't afford that. America can't afford that. And it is to prevent New Mexico families from these repercussions that I will vote for this legislation. But that's the only reason. Because to be frank, almost everything else about this deal stinks. And it stinks to high heaven. As my friend, the good senator from Vermont, said yesterday, 
This package is grotesquely unfair and bad economic policy. While I firmly believe we must take steps to rein in our deficit, this package is far from the ideal way to do so. I hear every day from New Mexicans about the need to rebuild our economy. We should be investing in innovation and infrastructure and creating new jobs, but we don't do that with this deal. Instead of cutting excess and investing wisely in programs that create jobs, this package will mean fewer dollars for job training, for education programs and housing, hampering our ability to create a long-term recovery. Poll after poll shows a majority of American Americans support shared sacrifice in this recovery. Unfortunately, this package also falls woefully short on that count. While we, while we did manage to protect important programs like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and nutrition assistance programs, there are still many, many important programs that will be on the chopping block. Initiatives like housing assistance, help for small businesses, and rural economic development programs, just to name a few. This, all the while, the tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans and large corporations remain untouched. This package is what happens when ideologues bent on nationalizing their extreme agendas get their way. The fracture that we've seen among Republicans in the House over these last few months has much broader effect than just in that chamber. Their staunch refusal to compromise at the expense of struggling families has pushed this debate and our nation to the brink. Instead of having a frank conversation about how we can repair our economy and reach a simple compromise, we've been forced to vote today to avoid default. With this plan, we get nowhere near the heart of our economic problems. Instead, we kick the can down the road a couple of years. All the while, the problem continues to grow, impeding our recovery and crippling our economic competitiveness. Once this vote is taken and the immediate crisis is passed, it will be all too easy to stick our heads back in the sand and pretend everything is okay. I rise today to say this, everything is not okay. And it won't be okay until we have the courage and leadership to institute tax reform, not just trimming around the edges or rearranging the numbers to create the illusion of savings when in fact nothing has changed. I'm talking about substantive tax reform that is the result of a national conversation about our priorities as a society. We have the opportunity to do just that with the commission being created by this plan but it will take guts and leadership and hard choices. Our national deficit is a burden that drags us down competitively and requires serious negotiations, not just concessions to those who see this as a political opportunity to push their personal agendas. We must all come to the table and do what is best for our nation. I see the senator from Florida is here and so uh, and, and I know uh, he's a, a wise gentleman that has much to say to us. And so with that, Madam President, I would yield the floor. Thank you. <laughs> Madam President. The Senator from Florida. Again, I say to my colleague from New Mexico, what a fine senator he is, as is the senator uh, presiding. Uh, what a privilege it is to serve with the likes of the both of you. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, the members of this body, they're just extraordinary individuals. And we've all uh, we've anguished with what we've been through uh, as the clock was constantly ticking down to midnight tonight. 
and knowing the consequences. This senator always had the feeling that it was going to work out, that we were going to reach agreement. And interestingly, the financial markets had that same uh, feeling as well because the financial markets never did go off of a cliff. Even, even the Asian financial markets uh, felt the same thing as uh, we were coming out of the weekend. And so uh, even though we in this capital city of our nation have gone back and forth over ways to cut this public death, debt, uh, here we are, and we have an agreement. Members of this body, as well as the other one down at the other end of the United States Capitol, clearly are sincere in their differences. But I think what you're seeing in the overwhelming vote yesterday in the House of Representatives, that most of the members agree that gridlock doesn't do anything to help the country and especially uh, the economy. And so we've got this compromise plan in front of us and later today one of two things will be true. Either we will have done what is in the best interest of the American people or we will have failed. And I think overwhelmingly uh, what uh, we are going to do when we vote at noon today, I, I think uh, it could be as much as 75 votes of this 100-member United States Senate that will vote in favor of this package. I think uh, not only is it obvious that this package is the way to avoid default, but it starts us on the path of getting serious about what we have to do. More than two trillion dollars bringing down the deficit over the course of the next 10 years, and that's according to the Congressional Budget Office. It's going to cut about half of that now, and it leaves the rest of it up to a super committee of 12 uh, members, half from the House of Representatives, half from the Senate, each of those halves appointed by the respective leaders of the chambers. And so it is possible that they will deadlock, but I think with the concern about the financial precipice that we have been teetering on, I think that super committee is going to come up with a significant uh, def deficit reduction. They've got a target of about an additional one and a half trillion dollars over the next 10 years, but they're not limited to that. And everything's on the table. So what they could do and this is a moment that if we can seize it, it would be tremendous. And that is, we can do major tax reform. Now, is anybody happy with the existing tax code as it is? And you know, we talk about all of these tax loopholes. The technical term is tax expenditures. What they are are special interest tax preferences for individual special interest, and it blows your mind to realize that they will cost $14 trillion over the next 10 years. Well, why should this special interest have a tax preference and this one have a tax preference and yet, we find it difficult as we go through the harangues here in our debates on what is the level of the tax bracket taxation, 
on ordinary people. You know what you can do? And the super committee can do this. They can take a lot of those tax preferences, 14 trillion, they can take only 15 or 20 percent of those away. And by utilizing that revenue, you could simplify the tax code into three tax brackets for individuals, and you could lower everybody's tax in that income bracket. And you could lower the corporate income tax. Now, that's a real possibility that this super committee could do. And, of course, they could give the instructions back to the Ways and Means Committee in the House and the Finance Committee in the Senate. And then you start to do reform as well as bringing down the national annual deficit. And so the backup, if this super committee fails to agree, then there are a series of spending cuts that automatically happen. Uh, you know this uh, agreement also calls for a vote on a balanced budget. I have voted for balanced budget constitutional amendments in the past. And we're going to have another opportunity to vote for one. I assume we're going to have a, a, a vote for two different versions. And the version that's being offered by Senator Udall is the one that I intend to vote for. So here we are with a plan that is not a perfect plan. It clearly avoids default. But all of us agree that what it does do is that government spending must be cut, that the public debt must be reduced. Otherwise, our economy will not recover and America will no longer be in good standing around the world. That's the bottom line. So I often quote it. It's actually from the book of Isaiah, in which uh, the Lord is speaking to the people, and he says, come, let us reason together. Isn't that so true here? And was it not avoided for so long, where reasonable people of goodwill and every one of these senators is a person of goodwill. If we can get out of our ideological rigidity and out of our momentary excessive partisanship, then as the good book says, come let us reason together. And I think that that's what we've done. So when we pass this, and it'll be an overwhelming vote in about two hours, and the president can sign it into law, then we can turn our attention back to the economy and creating jobs, which we so desperately need to bring us out of this recession that has been lingering far too long. Madam President, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Madam President, I yield the floor. Senator from Michigan. Um, uh, we have, I, no, I understand that uh, are we uh, alternating? That's correct. That is correct. And I would uh, request that uh, after the senator from Kentucky who's here to I'm speak. Sorry. In that case, uh, I, I believe I was uh, here on the floor before the Senator from Kentucky, so I will proceed. Uh, Madam President. The Senator from Michigan. Madam President, uh, to say that the legislation uh, before us is not ideal is truly an understatement. 
the notion that our deficit problem can be solved solely by cutting spending flies in the face of our experience when in fact unwise tax cuts for the wealthy and egregious tax loopholes are significant culprits in our fiscal crisis. I believe too many Republicans are influenced by an ideology so extreme that it promised to wreak economic havoc if it did not get their way. No additional revenues became the battle cry, an approach that prevents the balanced deficit reduction that the American people rightly support. The result is that this legislation incorporates some policies that are profoundly unfair to middle-income Americans. So seen in isolation, Madam President, this is not a good bill. But no public policy exists in a vacuum. Despite its many flaws, this legislation must pass. And let me explain why. While there will be a number of negative consequences as a result of this bill's passage, there will be more dire consequences if it fails to pass. The choice here is between a faulty piece of legislation, on the one hand, and severe damage to our economy and even greater joblessness on the other. The choice we face now, today, with this vote, is whether to accept a flawed bill or to watch the United States, the globe's preeminent economic power, default on its obligations to senior citizens, students, and veterans, as well as to those who have invested in our country by the purchase of our bonds and our Treasury notes. We've taken many steps in the past three years to try to restart job creation in this country. Those efforts would come undone if the crisis that would follow our, in a crisis that would follow our failure to pass this bill. One of the things that is right about this legislation is that it avoids a misguided demand that we have another round of crisis in negotiation over this issue in just a few short months. A short-term increase in the debt limit, as House Republicans demanded, would surely have led to a damaging downgrade of the government's credit rating. It would have frozen financing for businesses and consumers. We simply cannot put the American people and the American economy through that again. Despite this bill's imbalance in focusing slowly, solely on spending cuts, it does contain a mechanism that can force acceptance of what our Republican colleagues have refused to accept, the reality that revenue must be a part of real deficit reduction and that fair and effective deficit reduction efforts require shared sacrifice. 2011 is the year of unbalanced spending cuts. 2012 must be a year of shared sacrifice, one in which the president uses the bully pulpit to lead the nation to accept the notion that everyone, including surely the wealthy, must play a role in reducing deficits. Democrats have repeatedly emphasized this point. It is a simple fact that among the largest factors contributing to our deficits is the Bush tax cuts, tax cuts that greatly increased the growth of the gap between the wealthiest among us and working families. Today, median household income, the income of the typical American household, is lower than it was in the mid-1990s. And yet, the wealthiest Americans not only do extremely well, they are doing better and better all the time. A few decades ago, the wealthiest 1% of all Americans took in 10% of all income. Today, it's 24%. These numbers are not aberrations, nor actions of a free market. They reflect policy choices. And too often, the choice has been to pay lip service to the middle class while driving income inequality to levels not seen in 80 years in this country. The failure to ask all Americans to join in the sacrifices required to reduce our deficit flies in the face of logic and fairness and threatens to increase the growing gap 
between upper income and middle income families. <coughs> Democrats have proposed common sense steps to address the failure to include more revenue and to promote shared sacrifice. We've proposed restoration of the 39.6% tax bracket for the wealthiest Americans who make nearly $400,000 a year or more. Most Democrats support the end of tax breaks for the massively profitable oil companies. We seek to close loopholes that now allow, now allow tax dodgers to hide income and assets in overseas tax havens to avoid the taxes that they rightly owe and to end tax breaks that let highly paid hedge fund managers enjoy a lower income tax rate than the rate that their employees pay. So far, too many have denied the need for these changes. But there is a chance, at least, that this legislation may finally force consideration of added revenues, added fairness in the tax code, and the shared sacrifice that is so missing from the cuts in the legislation before us. Now, why is that? Under this legislation, we will face a stark choice. We must agree before the end of this year to deficit reduction of at least $1.2 trillion over 10 years or stand by as an automatic budget cut kicks in to accomplish that goal. A bipartisan joint committee of 12 members of Congress will meet and develop a deficit reduction plan that avoids those automatic cuts. That joint committee will have broad powers to review and propose changes to spending and to the tax code and to add revenues. Revenues will finally be back on the table where they have always belonged. Now, meeting that $1.12 trillion goal is not going to be easy, but it is achievable. Achievable, that is, if those who have so far been unwilling to compromise can recognize that revenue must be part of the equation. Nobody should be eager for the automatic cuts that would otherwise take effect. Many of those cuts would be unacceptably painful and damaging. But the very idea of those automatic cuts is that they are so unacceptable that few of us will want to see them enacted. And most of us will be willing to compromise in order to avoid them. Congress used this approach once before. In 1985, we passed Graham Rudman Hollings, which set forth specific deficit targets and required cuts if those targets were not met. The framework for today's legislation is based on that model. As one of the authors of the Graham Rudman Hollings Act put it, Senator Graham, quote, it was never the objective of Graham Rudman to trigger the sequester. The objective of Graham Rudman was to have the threat of the sequester force compromise and action, close quote. And it did. For example, in 1990, when facing the possibility of unacceptable cuts in defense and other important programs, President Bush and bipartisan leaders in Congress adopted a balanced deficit reduction plan that included significant new revenues. The Damocles sword of the Graham Rudman's Hollings Deficit Reduction Act was the reason for that outcome. I believe that any plan from the bipartisan committee that fails the test of balance will have no chance of passage in the United States Senate. That means that members of the committee must truly be willing to lead, to put aside partisanship and rigid ideology if we are to avoid triggering unacceptable cuts. Success also is going to require presidential leadership and stronger use of his bully pulpit. Democrats have demonstrated that we are willing to put forward serious deficit reduction proposals, plans that include painful cuts to important priorities. With a vote to approve this bill, which we must, it is my hope that we have reached the high tide of an ideological movement that has sought to hold tax cuts for the wealthy sacred while imposing increasingly draconian cuts on American families. 
and threaten economic calamity if that movement did not get its way. The era of slashing programs that help middle class Americans with no shared sacrifice by the wealthiest among us, that era must end and give way to an era in which fairness and balance guide our efforts. Passing this legislation today, hopefully, will drive us to make that transition. I thank the chair and I yield the floor. The senator from Kentucky. Would the senator yield uh, the senator from Kentucky? Sure. Uh, I would ask and ask consent that I be permitted to give my remarks immediately following the Without objection. Senator from Kentucky. Thank you. Madam President. The senator from Kentucky. America will not default on her debt today. In fact, there was really never any doubt that America would pay her bills. But mark my words, America will default. America will default not by not paying its bills, not by not raising the debt ceiling, but we will default in a more insidious way. America will default by increasingly paying our bills with money that is worth less and less each year. A nation pays for its debt in three ways. We can either tax people, we can borrow the money, or we can simply print the money. They all have repercussions. We are approaching our borrowing limit as a nation. We now owe China over a trillion dollars. We owe Japan ne nearly a trillion dollars. We even owe Mexico. As we reach our borrowing limit, interest rates will rise and the prices in the stores will rise. You're already seeing this in your grocery stores. You're already seeing this in your gas prices. They're not rising de novo out of nothing. Your prices are rising because the value of your dollar is falling. The value of your dollar is falling because they are printing up money to pay for this exorbitant debt. In 2008, we went through a banking crisis and we doubled the monetary supply in four months doubling the money supply in four months. We bought things. The Federal Reserve bought toxic assets. They bought bad car loans and bad home loans. Where once upon your time your dollar was backed by gold, your dollar is now backed by toxic assets. Not a very comforting thought. Many pundits are arguing that the Tea Party has won this battle. They misunderstand the debate. This battle isn't about winners and losers. It's about the future of our country. It's about saving ourselves from ourselves. We are headed towards ruin if we continue on this path of spending money we don't have. For decades, America has lived beyond her means. A nation that lives beyond her means will eventually live beneath her means. That day is coming. A day of reckoning looms. That day was never August 2nd. That day is when the dollar teeters and falls from its perch. That day is when prices soar. That day is when unemployment and a declining standard of living foment discontent and unrest in the street. As Erskine Bowles put it, there has been no more predictable crisis in our history We've been given all the warning signs. It comes, and this deal will not escape the facts that are looming for us. The president thinks that we need a balanced approach. Well, America thinks we need a balanced budget, and that we shouldn't spend money that we don't have, and that when American families have to balance their budget, why in the world will we not require our government to balance its budget? What America needs is a balanced budget and an economy that grows and thrives and creates jobs. And yet, a malaise hangs in the air. America is a ship without a captain. Instead of the president chastising job creators and preaching class envy, we need a president that will show us leadership. The president needs to accept responsibility for an economy that has worsened under his failed leadership. Unemployment is up, gas prices have doubled, and this president will add more debt than all 43 presidents combined. America got a deal 
on August 2nd, but not a solution. What America wants is a solution, not a deal. I hope in the next six months, the president will find it within himself to lead the nation. The courage to lead and embrace reform, the reform that is necessary to get this great country going again. Thank you, Madam President. I yield back my time. The Senator from Utah. Madam President, I compliment the distinguished Senator from Kentucky for his good remarks on the floor and thank him for allowing me that unanimous consent request. Madam President, we're, we're coming down to the wire here. We will soon be voting on a proposal that would couple some deficit reduction with an increase in the statutory debt limit. There are some positive features in this legislation, and the Senate's minority leader, the Speaker of the House, and the conservatives throughout the country should be commended for insisting on them. First, the President asked for a clean debt limit increase, and conservatives refused. They held the line and made clear that any increase in the debt limit required matching deficit reduction. Second, having lost the fight over a clean debt limit increase, the President insisted on a balanced approach to deficit reduction, by which he meant reducing the deficit by raising taxes. The conservatives again fought this back. They knew that the primary driver of our debt is spending. And regardless of the President's talking points, non-defense discretionary spending is at historic levels. We are set for our third straight trillion dollar deficit. We have a national debt of over fourteen and a half trillion dollars. And the President's budget will give us thirteen trillion dollars more in debt. The answer to this is not giving the government more money to spend. And third, conservatives resisted the effort by the President's allies to push most of the deficit reduction in this package down the road. So there are some achievements in this proposal that conservatives can hang their hat on, and I compliment Speaker Boehner and, and uh, Minority Leader uh, McConnell for their work. But I regret to say that I will not be able to support it because it does not sufficiently provide us with the solution to the debt crisis that the markets are demanding. Last week, Moody's made clear that the real threat to America's AAA rating is not default, which even the administration now acknowledges was never going to happen. The real threat of a downgrade comes from a failure of will. It comes from a failure of presidential leadership in getting federal spending under control. There is a solution to this spending crisis. It is cup-cap balance, which I was an early supporter, uh, of which I was an early supporter. In addition to providing short-term relief by cutting and capping spending, it provides for a long-term solution through passage of a strong balanced budget amendment. Now, this proposal falls well short of cut-cap cut, balance, and therefore I, I reluctantly cannot support it. I would like to address a technical point about this package that raises concerns for me. Whether the President is looking to the Deficit Reduction Committee as an opportunity to raise taxes. He says that he is, as have some of my colleagues in the Senate. I do, I do believe that it will be very difficult, given the Committee's charge to reduce the deficit, to raise marginal tax rates. However, I worry that some Democrats will be looking at tax expenditures in order to hit the committee's required deficit reduction targets. Now, this would be a mistake for a number of reasons. The President has referred to tax expenditures as, quote, spending through the tax code, unquote. But rhetoric aside, tax expenditures are an opportunity for individuals and businesses to keep more of the money that they earn. And getting rid of tax expenditures without corresponding reductions in tax rates will result in a net tax increase on the American people. The President would have you believe that getting rid of tax expenditures is acceptable because they only impact the rich. That is why he talks about bonus depreciation for jets and yachts used as, a second, as second homes. Yet in a series of speeches, I have attempted to show that this rhetoric of class warfare might work politically, but as a description of tax reality, it is lacking. The fact is, the largest tax expenditures, those that the President and the Democrats would have to look to in order to raise revenue for deficit reduction, benefit middle class itemizers the most. Consider the example of the home mortgage interest deduction. This is the most significant of the itemized deductions available to taxpayers. The mortgage interest deduction is the second largest 
tax expenditure identified by the Joint Committee on Taxation, and it is not, it is not primarily a benefit for the wealthy. 30% of the benefit of the mortgage interest tax expenditure goes to taxpayers over $200,000. Taxpayers with income below $200,000 receive 70% of the benefit of the mortgage interest deduction. By a ratio of almost 2 to 1, taxpayers under $200,000 benefit from the mortgage interest deduction. Since $200,000 basically fits the definition of rich used by my friends on the other side of the aisle, we can see that the non-rich or middle income group disproportionately benefit from the mortgage interest deduction. The larger point is this, however. To the extent that the home mortgage interest deduction or any tax expenditure for that matter should be addressed by Congress, it should be addressed through the context of a comprehensive revenue neutral tax reform that lowers taxes and broadens the base. These tax expenditures should not be cherry-picked by the President and his liberal allies to pay for the giant checks that his administration has written. Mr. President, I would like to make a last procedural point about where we go from here. Even if Congress passes and the President signs this deficit reduction package, we are going to be back at this again before the year is out. The President will be asking Congress to raise the debt ceiling again, and given that, I would like once again to address the failure by the Treasury Department to respond to repeated requests I've made over the past week about Treasury's short-term cash position and the failure by almost every member of the so-called Financial Stability Oversight Council, or FSOC, to provide Congress with information about their contingency plans in the event there is a ratings downgrade on the U.S. debt in the future. Does Treasury still think it will run out of cash by midnight tonight? I've been given only limited information. Treasury continues to say we will run out of cash today and will not be able to pay our bills the same date they estimated way back in May. But Treasury won't show me, the ranking member of the Senate Finance Committee, how they are arriving at that estimate. I have not been informed, uh, Congress has not been informed, and Americans counting on timely Social Security payments have not been informed. Almost every member of the FSOC, including Treasury and Federal Reserve, has refused to provide me with any information about their contingency plans for ratings downgrades. Even if the debt limit is raised, there is no assurance that we won't face a downgrade. We need to know the government's plans. It should rise above politics. Mr. President, as I've said repeatedly, this is unacceptable. I want to be clear about two things. First, Congress will have to look into this matter very carefully and investigate whether Treasury and most of our major financial regulators have been deliberately withholding information from Congress, and if so, for what purposes? Second, assuming that down the road Treasury will present Congress with another default date, I want to put them on notice that this fall I will be demanding timely substantiation of Treasury's assessment and the government's cash position. Absent this cooperation, I will stand in the way of any debt limit increase demanded by an unsubstantiated Treasury-determined deadline. Mr. President, in closing, I want to be clear. I cannot support the outcome of these negotiations, but my opposition is not owing to the failure of conservatives or the Republican leadership in the House and Senate. It is owing to what is clearly amounting to the failed presidency of President Obama. He and his allies are ideologically committed to more spending. Fortunately, the American people will have the final verdict on this economic philosophy in 2012. Mr. President, I ask that uh, my full remarks be included in the record.